Hello, I welcome you to the Psychology of Global Crisis Conference hosted by the American University of Paris. This is the keynote address of Professor Alessandro Fasolo. I am Maria Medved, Professor of Psychology and one of the core organizers of this event. I will be moderating this session. Originally, Alessandra worked at the University of Rome. I believe she is a true Roman. Presently, she is based at the University of Portsmouth in the UK, continuing the good stuff she's always done. Her work blends linguistics, linguistic anthropology, and psychology. Alessandra has consistently published on numerous fascinating topics. These include, for example, social interaction and children's language socialization, space and objects in autobiographical remembering, and communication practices in mental health and learning disabilities. I'd like to add that I'm especially happy to introduce Alessandra as her unique blend of research on clinical topics has had a large influence on my own scholarship. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Alessandro Fasolo, giving her talk entitled The Acopolyps and the Children, The Space-Time Crisis in Family Homes. Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here in the morning, if you are here um, on Friday morning. And now I just uh, start with my presentation. So, as probably many of you have reacted when you heard about this conference and being able to participate, was the reaction was, yeah, great. And at the same time, I don't have time for this. Um, but somehow I just knew instantly what I wanted to talk about, um, which is what's happening with children at home with their family. The reason for this is that somehow I had several threads going on. So following links as we do these days, it's just like we're not surfing the net, we're actually walking a thick jungle of links and suggestions and things. So I found out about this biography in The Outsider, which I <clears throat> put on the Kindle and read in an afternoon. It's really quite entertaining, but also rather scholarly. And so that sent me back to read a book that I had kept aside for some time, Harry Heff's Labor of Love, really, Ecological Psychology. And that was also um, fed by my friends telling me stories about their life at home, friends with children, and especially one friend that you will see in this presentation that um, recalled and, and reported to me the difficult questions her child asked about time and the difficulties she had in finding the right answer for a three-year-old. But also that's always been a fascinating topic for me, not only observing children but also the, the, the role and relevance of place in autobiographical memories. Um, and I just love the title of this book that kind of grasps the concept very very well which is childhood and other neighborhoods so child childhood as space essentially or place more more precisely so what can the crisis do for us so i this presentation will be somehow positive around the changes in lifestyles that have been forced upon us because whether we wanted or not, we had to rearrange our lifestyle in many ways, but it's socially the way we are with others, if we are with others. Not everyone is sharing this time. So also time, you know, ways of being alone. And, uh, and how to use what's in the house, because that's where we are constrained into. So I will talk about families with young children and some adjustments that they had to do for the crisis that happened in their household and some of the perks that came with it. So it would be a series of snapshots of family life with children between two and seven and uh, really as a starting point, so it's not a very developed discussion at all, but as a starting point about how 
the way we conceptualize adult and children relationship is embodied in the way society designed family, space and time and children and adult space and time. And by relationship I really mean ways of being together which of course has also uh, effects on the general sort of psychodynamic relations between adults and children. But also what parents might miss out when space and time are segregated as they tend to be in the way we live. And how prolonged changes in the organization of our everyday life can produce rather intense and novel experiences around space and time. So my friends have been very kind. Initially I thought I would have to, to do a sort of mediatic harvesting of videos and uh, stuff from, um, uh, from the internet. But then starting to talk, my friends have been really generous and I actually managed to interview four of them, four parents, all in dual parent family, um, all families and their parents are able to work from home and are mostly academic, as you might imagine. And they initially had changed their names, but then I realized that there are little names on the videos, so I will just call them um, with the little names. And so they have children, like there are two, two children families. In one, the children are sort of more apart. Um, almost six years, in another one only two years, and then there is a only son Theo, almost three, and Melissa, uh, seven years old. And um, apart from one that lives in a fairly large house, the other live in kind of apartments, smaller apartments, but all have garden or access to outdoor space. Um, and it, I'm very aware that these situations I will be talking about and actually my friends will be talking in the videos you will see are not particularly common necessarily, uh, or at least not in all their aspects, uh, and they're relatively fortunate. But I think that um, they still allow seeing how the work they have had to do, we might, might teach us some lessons, but it, like we had this presentation on the first day, I think, panel one, about migrations and how the migrants' family can have like isolation on top of isolation with the COVID crisis and distancing on top of distancing. So there are very different situations. But also in those presentations there were similar problems like fathers being worried about not uh, being good enough teachers and things like that. So all the families experienced an initial sort of crash and crisis. Um, in fact, feminist writers Cavallero and Gago talk about the implosion of the house. It's a concept that they had before COVID, but that now has become relevant, of course, also in cases very much more dramatic than the ones we are discussing. So the experience is that there is a space-time compression. There's no time for anything. The children are always on the parents, almost literally. And small children are really puzzled about the unraveling of their daily routines. There is a lot of anxiety about this growing threat. And so my friend who lives in Rome, she says, it was unthinkable not to be together all the time, even if I went out for the garbage, I would tell everyone I'm out, I'm going out. Um, and um, and also there is anxiety about children not having their time organized and having a further learning context set to them. The image on the right will be explained in the next slide. So this is the first video is about this child's really uh, not understanding what's going on uh, with routines in the house. Non lo so, tesoro, vai dentro a vedere che sono dentro. E, però le routine, devo dire la verità, ancora adesso lui mi chiede, <ride> c'ha pure ragione, mamma, 
Ma perché mangiamo sempre? <ride> perché è chiaro, io non cucinavo mica, cioè tra l'altro non cucinavo, non ho mai cucinato così tanto in tutta la mia vita, credo, perché cioè, cucino a pranzo e cena. E, e l'altro giorno mi sono trovata a dirgli, ma guarda Teo che tu mangiavi due volte, anche, è come se mi chiedesse, ma perché mangiavo due volte? So, yeah, the, the puzzlement is about obviously doing the same thing in the same place. And so in the end, because of all these questions, it's also about like, is it today the evening of today or the evening of, tom of tomorrow? Um, Marilena created like the wheel of time, like following some advice on the web. And so the child could move the arrow around and know whether it's like night time where we sleep or evening where we eat or afternoon when we play and so on. Um, this is a story, the next story, with, a, with an older um, child. So this is Simon with uh, Melissa, seven years old. But for me, that adjustment period was um, short but very severe. So I had to change my entire approach to to how I did my work and I had to come to accept I can't do my work when I want to do my work. So I just have to carve out these spaces. But we're at a point now that has settled. So we did have this short explosion at the beginning where everything was up in the air. But we've learned to adapt. And, you know, I have my meetings through here now, so I don't take up space. In so, yeah, initial crisis and uh, in explosion and everything up in the air. For me, that adjustment period. Sorry, sorry, I just muted. So, this is something that was also in the media a lot um, at the beginning as you can see it for example this New York Post article was March 19 parents are losing their minds there were kids at home during the coronavirus um, it's, it's interesting also like coronavirus has become like a time like during coronavirus you know, even lockdowns and like that and uh, and yeah, and so in the article they report of a mother saying, "I'm very stress if I'm doing it right and if my child is going to fall behind, because I'm currently juggling so much." And uh, this pressure was felt by all parents, although in different ways, and in the end with different outcomes depending on the child's age, with different decisions about how to to answer to this de general demand but so this is an account about what happened both in terms of organizing the routines and in terms of the pressure of um, having the children learn all the time inizio è stata un'organizzazione proprio 50 e 50 la mattina lavoro io il pomeriggio lavori tu con un cambio di palla e con delle cose in da subito, diciamo, con dei momenti di compresenza invece in cui noi in qualche modo abbiamo dato per scontato che ci saremmo stati tutti e due, per esempio il pranzo. All'inizio questa era la, la, la routine abbastanza schematica ed era quasi scontato che chi stava con i bambini in qualche modo doveva organizzare qualche attività, cioè c'era qualcosa da fargli fare, bisognava fargli fare qualcosa. Anche perché sin dall'inizio, e poi anche qui è proprio completamente scemata questa cosa, si sono attivati canali più o meno formali, da, sui social media, un po' attraverso le maestre, cioè il mondo ha deciso che bisognava fare, fare qualcosa a questi bambini. So, yeah, so this was a bit of a long clip, but I think it really includes a lot of what we are discussing. So the idea that now we are all going to organize things as much as possible as they were before, to have sort of long stretches of work time divided so that the parents can have a shift, and then and what can we do for them? And then so the parent that not only had like five continuative hours with both children in this case, also had to 
organize things. And as it turns out, also sometimes they had to organize the night before because with small children, there is a, a lot, there's a sort of um, length of time that everything includes. So, um, in general, homeschooling have this problem that children perceive home as non-school and that sometimes you have to engage at the same time both children of different ages. So, for example, in Iris' case in which um, she has two children of almost six years apart, uh, she has to do maths with the older child, but then she has to sort of sing the multiplication song to the to the smaller child because she can't switch topic because then the older child would just go. Uh, and so she has to really sort of, she calls it like in part being one of us that she had to change footing all the time in order to keep both children there, but sort of with the same <laughs> content or, or kind of words or language. And, uh, and in general, parents have to learn how to be teachers. And some of them have tried organic schooling. This was another colleague that actually told me, like, oh, we are trying. So we go to the beach and we have her count the pebbles, but she immediately knows what we're doing and she kind of tells us off. And I really wanted to share those because um, you will see why it's in homage to Goffman. It's still about homeschooling and what solutions were found. Do, doing things like on paper and writing and doing the spelling, which now we get, you know, through an online platform, we print them and, and we have, it was, it's impossible. So that's what I told you last time, you know, like, I think that you needed you, we needed to then create like a play situation or something that was d pretending to be at school and um, to to be able to, for him to play this role of you know sitting down and uh, and thinking and, and 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 doing it really so you know so then we talked to, we talked to him about this about you know we have to and it's important because you're going to forget and all of that and then he was quite open to that and then and then he started to make it so it's it, in a sense he he guided us into creating this because he said oh so 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 he go he went back to imagining that this would be school because he said oh so you will be the teacher and i will be the pupil and i said yeah we can pretend it was like it came from him uh reading writing some numbers work and we kind of made it into a bit of a game uh -huh. how did you manage that i remember taking on it's going to sound strange but some kind of teacher persona that, that kind of um, it bracketed it off from the home life. And that included break times where Melissa would line up outside class to come back in. Although we don't do that now, that seemed to manage the transition. So in both cases, we have a layering and a framing of the space, of the activity, um, which also involves different spaces. But essentially the, the child in Iris' case, sort of making the pretend uh, and setting up things so that then it could be believable. And in the other case, sort of being an initiative of the father and probably together uh, with Melissa to, to just uh, do school, play school. Um, in this sort of um, yeah bubble that they have created. So we saw that many things were decided at the beginning or attempted at the beginning, but as they say also in different parts of the interview, then there is a, an understanding that, you know, uh, this is a different type of emergency, one that is going to linger. And, um, and this idea of trying to have undisturbed continuous work time for both parents and children were actually, uh, was actually not sustainable. And this is also 
bad words like cosmology, cosmology when you have to stop proposing, imposing something all the time and let opportunities arise through boredom. And there is this discovery that children can actually self-organize. So on May 6th, so many weeks into lockdown, Valentina posted this, um, video, this Facebook post of her children playing in the bathroom and uh, she uh, added this quote from Pippi Longstocking that says it is absolutely necessary for small children to have an organized life especially when they organize it themselves and in the comments some friends saying what are they doing and uh, cooking up a much better version so another educational expert that is not Pippi Longstocking um, also recommends um, to to get the children self-organized. So this was Montessori and um, Marilena in fact told me one person I've just seen you know she's she's quite someone that we should go back and, and read because she had some uh, advice from an, an expert of Montessori method and so anyway one uh, way in which Montessori's story is told is like that she noted episodes of deep attention and concentration, multiple repetitions of activity and the sensitivity to order in the environment. Given free choice of activity, the children showed more interest in practical activities and Montessori's materials than in toys provided for them and were surprisingly unmotivated by sweets and other rewards. Over time, she saw a spontaneous self-discipline emerge. So interestingly, something I didn't know, she had started with children with disabilities and then understood that her method was actually valid for, for typical children as well. And, uh, and so she developed, as you know, many Casa dei Bambini children houses and, and the whole Montessori method based on this interest of children for doing grown-up things, for being responsible for themselves, for getting engaged in serious work and, and, and for their pleasure in being concentrated in, in what they're doing. So I'm going back now for uh, a photo that this is there again, Marilena sang me the, this dad uh, doing some work around the garden and this is um, he was talking about how to deal with boredom. He, he has some days where he's really in a bad mood, and I'm wondering whether he's he misses something, whether he feels like he's in jail in a way, you know, like it's always the same thing. Um, but finds all the things that he's lost and he's so happy and he's like ah oh, the ball you know like he's been looking for that like for months and then he finds it again you know because he looks at he searches he has more time to open all of the drawers you know take everything out and he does more like things like house tasks like you know getting things to the table and uh, getting out, clearing the, um, like the dishwasher. So there is a sense in what she says about the, the child, the younger child, really sort of going deeper into the house, reappropriating the spaces and feeling sort of free, and also in you know in an independent way, sort of finding ways to entertain himself, and then this getting involved in domestic tasks and helping the mother with the dishwasher and so on like they would say maybe in other times we would wait for him to be asleep for cooking but now we have to maybe do something more important when he's asleep and so we um, let him just join and he's really enjoying it so there is overall a sense of intermingling of spheres of activity of business of uh, entertainment of boredom of doing nothing but in a sort of different quality 
of proximity perhaps than before. And this interpenetration of space is just a marginal family. So Simon would say, like now they have this kind of, it feels like a miniature office because they have the big desk where both he and his um, partner would work. And then now the child is like, really likes to be there with them and do her own thing. And Iris similarly was saying, well, I'm thinking of putting a small desk up here in the office where she works, because if you want to coexist, you need to merge your activities and create a hybrid environment. So I think this is a, a word that um, explains a lot. And uh, Valentina says, children have moved from the bedroom to the living room for playing, that is where their dad works. They sort of follow us around, but doing their own thing. And Marlena also said, oh, I've noticed, like, Theo moved his toys out in the garden and I'm just there working like this. So there's a spontaneous movement for children to sort of take their things where their parents are, but without disrupting the work and sort of do work or different types and maybe sometimes it's serious work, sometimes it's just playing depending on the age, but it's just being together, the pleasure of doing your own thing. Um, close to the other, which is a sort of very Winnicottian idea, I think. And the perks I was talking about. So there is this idea of like really by co-experiencing more things, learning about how your child does things, what they enjoy, what you know, um, how they play and things like that. So the photo on the left is, she was sent by Marilena herself, that she had taken it and she had um, used it and sent it to others before, like just to to share, you're really enjoying playing with your child in a way very liberated that uh, she maybe not very often could experience before, not for long, not, or, you know, not playing so much with the child but sometimes playing for the child because he needs to be entertained but she she thought that the picture actually expressed the, the joy and fun that both of them were having like in you know putting these hats on and the little apron that you can see on the tail as well and so you know doing dressing up play um, and this is about discovering how your child all the child as well plays um, when they are with the children. I was happy, I had this idea, I wanted to write a piece sometime about how free play is not free at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's like supposed to be this creative uh, where you have this imaginary world, no. <laughs> You're not, you know, it's, it's not, it has a very, it's a very strict, you know, like, so then I have to be, then we spend all the time, you know, talking about who am I going to be, who am I, who am I, what are my super powers, um, am I a girl, am I a boy, what's my name? Uh, what, who was my mother, you know, like we have all of these sort of things. And then when we come to play, and then I say, come on, Batman, let's go for the mission. He says, no, you cannot do that. So, yeah, just learning how your child play can be very surprising. Um, I'm not sure that I'm actually recording myself in here because I don't see the little window with myself like the panopto window, but I obviously you can see myself in various guises and sizes um, in these different recordings that were done through different systems and also uh, sometimes by me, sometimes by the other person. So I don't think it needs my face in this presentation. So the next one is about co-experiencing learning and actually seeing it happen. I see the delight in her face when she learns something new. I see how hard she tries when she's trying to understand something that's difficult, uh, such as uh, when she's working on fractions. Uh, I've seen how she's progressed in her knowledge in areas that she had no real knowledge of before, such as Spanish as a language, 
the Shang Dynasty, speaking Spanish, uh, ideas of Judaism. Yeah, so the joy of being there when the important learning occurred and not just sort of going through the homework, which I'm not saying that all these things can't happen in normal circumstances, but there is a sense here of really having access to something more, um, really to have a sort of privilege access, privilege access to uh, children's life. And we are going towards the conclusions here, and there is this surprising effect of just dropping this attempt of structuring everything and worrying that not much is happening and um, um, and thinking like my Elena said you that you can educate someone who is three years old they self educate she says so there is a sense of like letting go and um, these are some of the quotes. Valentina said, we realized that the four hour shift was not sustainable. Now we have shorter workouts, but every day is slightly different. So adjustable. Mylena says the time wheel is not used anymore. Now the child sort of looks outside, say, oh, it's becoming dark um, to, to orient and to expect when, um, when um, dinner is happening or something. And, and for him, it can happen because this is something that the family as a whole orients to more, to have a sort of more um, regular time in the sense that it goes with the day, with the sort of natural day, to an extent. And Marilena also says, this is a reflection I can only make because time and space have collapsed and now there is just time. And I could say I've adapted to Tao's time, but it's not true. We just embrace what happens. And um, finally, Valentina says, if I could keep something, this is a question I asked at the end, and she said, it would be this being more relaxed at home, staying rather than doing, that she wouldn't allow herself, she said, normally, because she feels that she can't just sort of uh, not do anything. And, um, and there is an idea of finding more time by letting time be. The loosening of the schedule somehow makes it more scheduled if if you know what i mean you end up putting less pressure on yourself to finish class by three o'clock uh and by doing that it somehow creates more time you um i mean we're we're getting through as i say melissa's core programming and sometimes she can have these lessons complete by lunchtime and then move on to something else. Sometimes it will be finished at three o'clock uh, or somewhere in between. But neither of them are early or late. They are just when they finish. So there is an idea that there's incredibly more time if there's no pushing through, if it's not giving a, a deadline when something has to be finished and then it's finished when it's finished. So interestingly there is a sense of this privilege, this this time that will be actually you said it's a once in a lifetime maybe opportunity for for this. And there is a little sense of like almost the nostalgia as seen from the future um, because this is going to be lost and um, so it's interesting when Molly Andrews talks about it, how time is dynamic and this future and past and present are all intermingled that there is a sense already because the, the reopening is happening that um, something might be lost <laughs> now, obviously, on the last one of the last slides, is it not ready? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I just, don't, I just don't know what will remain of all this. You know, I'm just. I think as soon as we go back, we're just gonna. 
<laughs> go back to everything that uh, you know we did before and whether there, whether you know some of the good things. So to conclude, I'm sure that you've already understood a lot of what I wanted to say. Just to go back to the points I highlighted earlier. So what did we learn about um, how society divides space and time and um, what the concepts that are there, are there? And well, we can say perhaps that work time, family time, segregation in blocks may hide a possibility for a more like wave-like pattern of work and childcare, which is not disrupted. So we know that when we are at work, we don't work all the time. And we, we, when we are with a child, we are not attentive to them all the time. But we think that's what we do. Let's think that this, this is how things are done and the way it's naturally organized and less disrupted. But it might be the, the other way around, at least sometimes. And uh, yeah, and parents may miss out when there is this segregation in how their children do serious play and their fun learning and how it is to do it with them. And then, of course, for me, there was this very, very interesting discovery that they discuss about how these changes have actually produced a, a different and very intense um, experience of the texture of time happening, like almost sensing it, almost appreciating how you can live a day that is a day, you know, with parts and, and as an end. And it and it's, uh, it has its own sort of deep unfolding that somehow feels good. And I wonder from the child's perspective. So, well, we have seen something. We have seen that there is also a restriction to work, to domestic chores, to younger siblings' care. And perhaps we can think that there is a, a way of experiencing the words of the others that is not antagonistic. To togetherness and enjoyment of home time, like they would perhaps perceive if they are at school or they 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 um, share a little time in the evening, and then there's more going on or over the weekends, and there's this sense of like not me when parents work. But here we have seen a sort of like emulation and wanting to be part of it because there is a lot of it all the time. And then we've seen how children have been able to instruct parents about their life outside at home and set up a proper pretend place of doing school properly and, and instructing parents like how you do a proper um, superhero uh, games and things like that. So there's been this ability to sort of do what many years ago we called mutual apprenticeship. In a, in a sustained way. And I'm sure there is a lot more for that. To conclude, really now, um, you know, talking about crisis, of course, there is a permanent crisis of psychology never reaching where psychology happens in a way. And uh, so Barker himself said that the scripture, natural history, ecological phase of investigation is at the minor plate in psychology and this had seriously limited the science which I think we all agree with. And even if things have changed, there's still a lot to do. So I think that the ecological, psychological program <laughs> still needs to be developed and, and expanded. That had to be the ecological, psychological program. But I'm sure you understand. And thank you.